Well, you made it, everybody, and we're so glad you did. Welcome to SJC's online worship experience. We're excited about today's gathering of worship, prayer, song. It's going to be an incredible time. If it's your first time with us, we want to welcome you. We're going to be talking about a sermon series called Lamp Life, and today we're talking about how God reveals to us our mission in the world. So let's get ready to do it, everybody. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord has shown forth his glory. Come and let us adore him. seen the wonder in the glimmer of her sight as the eyes begin to open and the blindness meets the light if you have so said I see the world in light I see the world in wonder I see the world in life burst in a See the wonder in the air second light Have it come out of the world Can you hold my love in love If you have so said I see the world in light I see the world in wonder I see the world in SJC, one of the things we do in our worship each week is have a time of confession of sin. It's an opportunity for us to just bring the things before God that are on our hearts, the guilt, the shame, 
uh, our brokenness, our sin before him, to be real before him in our confession of our lives, to allow him to bring his searchlight into our hearts uh, because we believe that he's the God of all grace and of forgiveness, that when we come before him confessing our sins, he brings the flood of his forgiveness. So let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. A reading from 1 Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord.
reading from Mark. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And he went a little farther, he saw John, James, the son of Jebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord. Well, it's the fourth Sunday of 2021. How you feeling? I'm checking in on your resolutions, which leads me to ask, how are you with goals and motivation? It's probably a little unfair to ask in the middle of a pandemic, I know. Maybe you're doing well, and so we congratulate you. Keep it up. But for the rest of us, you know, I'm just kidding. But most people have a love-hate relationship with goal setting and resolutions. Uh, on our best days, we're all working on a diet, a budget, and a life plan. And on our worst days, we're just trying to get out of bed and find the coffee. But in the midst of all of our highs and lows, we know that God is at work showing us his face so we can see our face. And as we'll see this work of revelation, well, it changes things. It changes us. It changes the world. Someone once said that when Jesus invites us, he invites us to go somewhere. Christianity is relational and it's moving toward a goal, heaven and earth becoming one, all things made new. Maybe you're like me. Sometimes in the midst of life's routines, you lose sight of the big picture. It gets clouded with bills and dirty dishes, forms to fill out, kids to worry about, work to stress over, relationships that feel tense, health concerns, politics, obligations, and that pain in your foot that won't go away. You go to bed at night wondering, is this my best? Am I, am I on the right track? Am I too old to change tracks if I'm on the wrong one? Maybe you're working your way through college and you're just unsure of what your future holds. The opportunities and challenges seem daunting. God, am I doing what you want me to do? Everything feels like such a mess. Today, we're on part three of our Lamp Life sermon series. We started the new year exploring the wonder and mystery of Revelation. How, how it is that God shows himself to us. S so far, we've unpacked the way that God reveals his own character and how he reveals our own identities. Today, we're going to explore how God invites us to respond to him. That is what God shows us about how to live. Knowing your identity answers the question, who am I? Knowing your purpose puts your identity into practical motion, which is what God's revelation does. It creates movement and inspires engagement and involvement. Every time God revealed himself in scripture, the byproduct was movement to, to walk in God's direction with the fruit of his blessing or to walk away from God's direction with the inevitable fruit of death and judgment. Our passage from Mark 1 today is really familiar probably to all of us. Jesus calls Peter and Andrew fishermen by trade and they drop their nets to follow. He calls James and John the sons of Zebedee and they also drop their nets and follow. Jesus indicates that they'll learn a new kind of fishing. They'll learn to fish for people. It's a foreshadow, of course, of their apostolic witness to the world, but also it's a foreshadow of hearts reborn, a new way to see yourself and a new way of seeing people and a new way actually to live. As followers of Jesus, we live under two mandates. That is, two sending commands that God gives. <clears throat> one is found in creation itself. We call it the cultural mandate. In Genesis 1 and 2, God told humanity, humanity, his image bearers, to be fruitful and to multiply, to work and keep the good creation, to be a representative of the Lord in that creation, to steward well all that he had given them. Even through the aftermath of the fall, even through the sorrow of a world shrouded by sin and death, our call to steward creation remained and still remains today. But there's also an additional mandate that we're called to pursue. We, we find it in the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize, in short, be stewards of the good news of God in Christ. Shine the light of Christ in word and in deed. All of humanity is ultimately accountable to both of these mandates. 
And every follower of Jesus, everyone has a role in both of those mandates. Be fruitful and multiply. Be a steward in creation and be a witness to the redemption at the work of, of God through Jesus. Paul Mar Robertson said that these two foundational mandates are basically two sides of the same coin. He said, quote, the mandate to preach the gospel and the mandate to form a culture glorifying to God merge with one another. Now, let's add into the mix this, this day the, the additional word from Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. The context of this passage is that Paul's teaching on the practical issue of marriage, and he uses this everyday example to emphasize the urgency of the kingdom and how our perspective as Christ followers is impacted by the present future reality of Christian hope and fulfillment. So listen to what Paul says. I do want you uh, to point out, friends, that time is of the essence. There's no time to waste, so don't complicate your lives unnecessarily. Keep it simple in marriage, grief, joy, whatever, even in ordinary things, your daily routines of shopping and so on. Deal as sparingly as possible with the things the world thrusts on you. This world as you see it is on its way out. I love the way Paul emphasizes simple. In my experience as a Christian, the Holy Spirit occasionally stirs people in extraordinary ways, but consistently inspires people in ordinary ways. You wake up early once a week to be at the prayer meeting. You sacrifice a couple hundred dollars a month to support a young campus minister in their work evangelizing and discipling college students. You say yes to serving on the board of a local nonprofit, doing great work in your community. You call that person you just met the other day to meet for coffee with no other agenda than just to get to know them a little bit better. You burn a week of vacation time and gladly spend it volunteering at your church's VBS. You begin to pray for your coworkers by name and take an interest in their families, listening to their needs and to their cares. When you think about your life's investments, you begin to think in terms of investing in others. When you think about your legacy, you think in terms of gospel witness. Well, what's happening with all that? What's happening there? All examples of keeping uh, your affairs with the world simple so you have margin and tension and provision to serve the greater goal of this age, uh, of the age to come. Paul reminds the Corinthians that they live at a particular intersection, that moment of overlap between this present age and the age to come. Jesus' ministry inaugurates and launches the beginnings of the age to come. In Jesus and through the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit, heaven has actually broken into this world, and yet, as we know, it hasn't completely taken over. That will happen when Jesus comes again. So in the midst of this overlap is where you and I live. And where you live, you live in this tension between being in the present age, but having experienced through the gospel a foretaste of the age to come. The key is to stay balanced. We're at the edge of the end of the age, but there's still patient, loving work to be done. And the way God is helping people to see heaven and the glory of his beautiful face is by meeting them in the midst of this weary world, places like where food is cooked, cars are repaired, on practice field where skills are learned, in offices where information circulates, where deals are made, in concert halls where poets sing, in businesses where products are moved, in classrooms where things are taught, in hospitals where the sick are cared for, on movie sets where stories are told, on construction sites where buildings are going up, and on college campuses where worldviews are being forged. The Christian life is being in the present world while pursuing the life of the world to come. Every day, with every prayer, every conversation, every meal prepared, every human interaction, every offering of grace one to another, each is a gesture, a word, a lift, a help, a listening ear, all of it in concert with God moves the story forward one moment, one minute, one hour, one day, one week, one month, one year, closer to the day, the day when all things are made new. See, when it comes to our existential musings of, are we doing, God, what you want? Maybe God's not asking you to go anywhere different or do anything different. Maybe he's actually inviting you to a different perspective in the places where you already are. Which is why Paul says to the disciples in Corinth, keep your life simple in marriage, grief, joy, whatever it might be, in ordinary matters, in routines like shopping, all the stuff that the world wants to thrust on you. Paul says, don't get tangled up, get freed up. Freed up so you can give, serve, 
share and be generous with your life? What would it look like in your life to engage this present age for the sake of the age to come? See, Jesus is the gift of the gospel. Through the gospel, we see ourselves in God's story, not as a pawn, but as an active participant. John Tyson, a pastor in New York City, recently preached about the power of narratives. He said, and I quote, all of us are deeply formed by the narratives we believe to be true. If you were to ask me what we are currently dealing with in our nation and inside the church, we are dealing with a narrative crisis. And I strongly agree with his words there, which is why the Bible is the greatest story ever told. And God forms us in and through his story. Maybe as you watch this today, you say, you know, that's my biggest question that I have right now. How do I even know what narrative my life fits into? There seems to be so many alternative narratives. Is there a great meta narrative that's actually big enough to hold the whole of humanity? How do I even know such a narrative even exists, which is such a worthy question. And if you're wrestling right there, I want to encourage you first that you're not alone. And I want to encourage you to explore and to earnestly explore Alpha is a great place to start that exploring, and you can find out more at alphawilmington.com. I encourage you to do that. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. You know, Jesus called the disciples for the special role of the apostolic ministry. And yes, they answered the call to follow Jesus by literally walking away from their vocation. They left their nets in response to the call. This isn't new. In the Old Testament, God called the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He called Noah, Moses, the prophets, kings, priests, to serve specific offices and specific seasons for specific purposes in the life of God's people. Likewise, in the New Covenant, God calls some to serve specific offices in the church, elders or presbyters, deacons, pastors, teachers. But everyone in Jesus' family is called, and there's no one called to follow Jesus who's not also asked to drop the nets of their old life, their old way of seeing, their old understanding for the new life in Him. Many of the people that Jesus encountered in the Gospels also wanted to literally follow Jesus, but he told them to go home. For them, his call to follow was no less a call than to anyone else. For most people, following Jesus doesn't mean a job or location change, though there is nothing wrong with a move or a job shift. It, it, it means that we see that job and understand that career in a whole new light. The life of the kingdom, the life of the Spirit moves through every vocational, familial, and leisurely environment that's occupied by a follower of Jesus. Your job is part of how you're faithful to both the cultural mandate to be fruitful and the gospel mandate to be salt and light to the world around you. It's where God has called you to build life-giving culture in His world and to be an agent of gospel light. See, when Jesus called the first disciples to follow Him, He was doing way more than asking them to change their occupation. He was inviting them to see the world and their own lives and the lives of others differently. Have you ever considered or thought about why you are in the role that you're in in life? Beyond, of course, I chose it or I worked for it or I went to school for umpteen years or it's been the family business for generations. I'm talking about beyond that. Have you ever said, God, thank you for the things that you've given for me to do. Thank you for the spheres of influence you've called me to engage in. Thank you for the opportunity I have to walk in your light. And God, help me to be your servant there. One of the post-communion prayers we say in our church has a beautiful line that commissions the people of God to do this very thing. It says, And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. This is a prayer for the artful living of spirit-driven discipleship. It's actually a revelation and it becomes possible to live this way when we see God and when we see ourselves in His light and hear the call of Jesus who whispers your name and then says to you, come, 
follow me and you follow him right into the ordinary places where you live, work, and play. And under that epiphany light, the lamplight of Jesus, everything begins to look possible because you're no longer just catching fish. You're influencing others for the sake of his name. Amen.
confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off, and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, hey everybody, we hope the Lord is blessing you abundantly through our time of worship today. It's so good to be together. You know, SJC is a church on mission. Our vision is unchanging, good news for all. Our mission is to help others discover their purpose through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are so many different ways that we're pursuing that mission together. And you can be involved in that with us. We really appreciate uh, partnership in the gospel, partnership in ministry together. You can go to our website, hit the event hub, figure out ways that you can link together with us for mission and ministry. We would love to connect with you. You can continue to give financially to the work of the mission and vision of SJC by simply sending in a check uh, to the address at the bottom of your screen. You can go to our website and hit the giving button, or you can give by text by entering the number at the bottom of your screen and following the prompts. We appreciate any and all gifts that really do add up to make a difference so that we can reach more people in the love and in the name of Jesus. God bless you today and your giving. Thank you.
the freedom of hope in our hearts how great is the love of the father Let us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to you and your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, what a great time we've had together in worship today, everybody. Thank you so much for being a part of it with us. Hey, we want to stay connected with you. You can find us anywhere and everywhere online at SJCILM. We hope that you will. Remember as you go today that Jesus loves you. He really, really does. And friends, Life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.